Hey there, I'm Joshua Sloan, and today I will be conducting a detailed comparison of two Telltale game series, Game of Thrones and Tales from the Borderlands. Both are episodic adventure titles that require the player take control of multiple characters and make decisions that purportedly tailor the rest of the experience. Both are adaptations of mostly well-received franchises, with unique settings and colorful characters that hook readers, viewers, and players easily. Both, as far as Metacritic is concerned, fared decently in episode-by-episode -episode critical reviews. But while they are built with similar skeletons, the end results couldn't be further apart, resulting in drastically different experiences that should have, fundamentally, felt relatively uniform. In the spirit of the great Noah Gervais, I will try and be as critically conscious as possible while still acknowledging my own personal feelings on the matter. Be warned, however, as this dissection will contain complete spoilers for both games, as well as spoilers for the first half of the Game of Thrones book and television series, and the previous Borderlands games developed by Gearbox Software. One last thing, thank you to the kind folks over at Gamers Little Playground for providing game footage when my system was uncooperative. Let's begin with Game of Thrones. Before I get into the game, you may need a brief rundown of the franchise it takes its lore from. Game of Thrones, the HBO series in turn based on George R. R. Martin's still unfinished novel series A Song of Ice and Fire, focuses on a multifaceted war for the Iron Throne of Westeros after its reigning king perishes. The factions involved include the Lannisters, the highborn family into which the deceased king married, the Starks, whose previous head Eddard acted as the prestigious king's hand for a time, and the growing forces of the distant continent Essos, led by a far-from-home Daenerys Targaryen, thought to be the last descendant of Westeros' historical rulers. Game of Thrones The Game begins during the infamous Red Wedding, where Robb Stark, king in the north, is slaughtered on his wedding night, along with his bride, mother, and a large number of guests and allies. It's a gruesome sight to behold, which makes it the perfect place, tonally, for a new Game of Thrones experience to start. Unlike most Telltale releases, which feature five segments, this game boasts six, count them, six episodes, each taking give or take two hours to complete. Over the course of the game, you play as several characters in the barely mentioned Forrester clan, a small house historically pledged to House Stark in the north. The playable characters are siblings Roderick, Asher, Mira, and Ethan Forrester, as well as Squire Garrod Tuttle. Each character quickly finds themselves in way over their head as they try to preserve the integrity of their house after their Lord Gregor, father to the Forrester siblings, is struck down at the Red Wedding. Depending on the character, the player will partake in diplomacy, espionage, romance, and a whole, whole lot of violence. Let me lay some groundwork for the game's plot via an overview of the first episode, which I will use to build upon in later analysis. You begin the game as Garrod, Lord Gregor's squire who is given a cryptic message by Lord Gregor in his final moments. The North Grove must never be lost. Garrod returns to Ironrath, home of the Foresters, but along the way encounters a band of Boltons, fellow Northmen and loyal to the vicious enforcer Ramsay Snow, attacking his, or rather your, family home. Your father lays dying, and you kill some or all of the Bolton soldiers in retaliation. You arrive at Ironrath shortly after to deliver news of Gregor's death, which thereby makes Ethan the new lord. Ethan is young though, third son after Roderick, who is thought to have died at his father's side, and Asher, who is currently exiled in Essos, and he lacks the experience and confidence necessary to run a house. This is Game of Thrones though, which means children inherit a position of power far beyond their ability, while women and men of actual skill and experience sit on the sidelines offering sage wisdom and praying the children heed it. Garrod's punishment for killing Bolton soldiers, whether he accepts willingly or not, is to be exiled to the Wall, a massive barrier of ice that protects the civilized Westeros from the mysterious dangers of the Far North. It's a common destination to send everyone from illegitimate children to rapists, which naturally deserve equal scorn. From there, however, Garrod has a clandestine objective to locate the North Grove and protect it at all costs. It's a myth to most, but like all myths, there must be at least a kernel of truth to it, right? While Garrod makes his journey north, Ethan takes up his lordly duties, which include choosing an advisor from one of two options, whose broad strategies boil down to diplomacy or military strength, and deciding how to handle a thief. Outside of your sentinel appointment, little else matters because the vicious Ramsay Snow appears at Ironrath and, in typical psychopathic fashion, kills Ethan while his mother and sister look on in horror. Hope you weren't invested in Ethan because he done got got. You see, the foresters control almost the entirety of the ironwood trade, a super hard breed of tree that requires careful cultivation and well-kept trade secrets to properly fashion into everything from shields to warships. In order to hold sway over the dwindling house, Ramsay grants half the ironwood forest to Lud Whitehill, another lord in the north and another shallowly vile man. He further has Lud Whitehill kidnap the youngest forester, Ryan, to be kept as a ward and instills a Whitehill garrison led by Lud's son Griff within the walls of Ironrath. While all of this is going on in the north, Mira Forrester is acting as one of two handmaidens to Marjorie, soon to be queen of King's Landing once she marries the petulant child King Joffrey. While most issues in the north are handled by swords, conflict in King's Landing is handled almost entirely with words and gold. Promises, betrayals, marriages, business ventures, and double talk abound here, 
endeavoring to exercise the player's diplomatic muscles more than their baser, more stabby ones. In this portion of the episode, you are forced to speak with Queen Cersei, Joffrey's mother, and prove your loyalty. Be careful, however, because Cersei will take note if your pledging allegiance to the Lannisters shows a disloyal streak by breaking your oaths to your family or Marjorie. Of course, should you declare loyalty to your house or Marjorie instead of Cersei, should the need arise, she'll berate you for not showing respect to the throne. You can't win with her, really, which is exactly the point. In King's Landing, it doesn't actually matter what you say or do. If someone above you has made a decision regarding anything from your attire to your mortal fate, there's just about nothing you can do to contradict it. It's roughly equivalent to being in a 24-7 Salem witch trial. Mir's goal, given to her by her mother, is to obtain aid from Marjorie for her house, which is dependent on how much you've pleasured the queen with your tongue. Diplomatically. At the same time, you are given the option to work with Tyrion Lannister, the queen's brother and current master of coin, to secure an exclusive Ironwood contract between King's Landing and House Forester. You also encounter a coal boy, who may prove useful should you need to do anything particularly sneaky, such as break into an office or hide a body. However you navigate these relationships, know that you are walking on thin ice, young lady. At the end of the episode, your situation may be marginally better or worse than other players depending on how well you navigated your choices. As with all Telltale games, each situation gives you two to four options choosing from binary person A or person B, as with choosing the Sentinel of Ironrath, or slightly more complex dialogue situations, of which silence is almost always a valid response. And, for everything else, there's quick time events. It's a system that has worked well for the company in the past, and for the most part continues to do so. If you find yourself enjoying one of their games less than another, it's not that core system that is flawed. Rather, the problems stem from everything that comes immediately before and after those choices flash on screen. Such is the case with Game of Thrones. Although I am not entirely caught up on the HBO series, I've watched enough episodes and read enough of the books to get a good understanding of the franchise's core theme. Everyone and everything is miserable. The villains are miserable. The heroes are miserable. The bystanders in their burlap sacks and muddy shoes are miserable. Heck, even the woman leading an army of freed slaves and riding on the back of a wyvern is miserable. Nobody gets out of this game alive or at least satisfied, because of how enormous the sacrifices are and how everyone around you appears to be entirely heartless and cruel. That, at least, is the theme that the game is going with. When you engage with the franchise elsewhere, however, that isn't quite the case. Sure, situations are often dire and George R. R. Martin is known to kill off beloved characters faster than you can run a spear through the wash, but that doesn't mean that the entire experience should be an exercise in futility and misery. Even if it is frequently in line with the tone of the source material, it flat out isn't fun for the player. In the series, characters experience travesties that need to be overcome or seen through to the end to allow others to step in and make improvements. Even characters at their lowest points experience triumph, real, meaningful triumph that gives them a grounding point to begin their upward ascent. There's almost none of that in this Game of Thrones experience. Offhand, I can think of maybe three moments across my 12-hour experience where I felt like I had actually done something right, something that would not almost immediately come back to bite me, and even less frequently did one of these choices actually go off without a hitch. Overall though, the theme of the game is less about embracing small victories amidst a mire of overwhelming defeats, but that of defeatism, full stop. By killing off one of your playable characters in the first episode, Telltale is sending a couple messages to their players. The first, and the one I believe they intended, is that players should remain vigilant, because one false move could result in very permanent consequences. The second, more problematic message, however, is that it really doesn't matter what choice you make, because you are not going to win. In truth, there is no situation where you could save Ethan. No matter how much you defy Ramsay Snow, or how eagerly you kiss the very ground he walks on, he still slits your throat and leaves you bleeding out in your mother's arms. This was decided from the moment Ramsay Snow appeared at Ironrath, but more than that, it was decided before you even booted up the game, a game that prides itself in embracing player choice and adjusting the story based on how the player interacts with it. Of course, this isn't a D&D session. You can't just shout out whatever action you'd like to do at your screen and expect the game to respond in kind. Due to both the limitations of the medium and the intent of the story within the context of a larger franchise, the majority of the story must be scripted in a way that allows the players to be funneled from one plotted moment to the next, with deviations being mostly minor save for a few exceptions, which need to be heavily worked to ensure the overarching plot can still stand. Therefore, Many of your actions in any Telltale game are not true choices, but illusions of choice. Whether you decide to be friendly, hostile, or silent to that town guard doesn't matter, because he will give you the same information by the end. However, how you choose your own side of the conversation helps determine what sort of personality and morality your character has. The big issue, the crux of all my complaints with Game of Thrones, is how obvious it is that it's almost entirely an illusion. 
You can see where the story needs to go and know that there isn't anything much you could do besides allow it to sweep you along to the next big set piece conversation. In truth, you can go huge portions of the game without pressing a single button, allowing the game to select the default timeout response of silence, and it won't affect the overall story one iota. Even some quick time events are scripted in such a way that if you're too late on the button press, everything still goes exactly as it should. And, should you actually choose dialogue options, you will often notice that the script either pays no attention to your specific response, or reacts as if you'd selected something different, like the most common A button response. Again, this is primarily because there are limitations to how branching a six-episode expanded universe project can be. Nothing the Forrester clan does can contradict the existing history of Westeros in the TV show universe that it's set in. Several prominent characters from the show, voiced by their live-action actors, make appearances in the game to prove that to you. Their conversations feel more hollow than ones with the less prominent cast, simply because they can only affect your plot so much. Not only is the plight of the Forrester family a low priority for most of Westeros, they're all too busy earning Emmy nominations to pay you much mind. In my opinion, Telltale did themselves a disservice by including so many familiar faces that are forced to partake in mostly passive roles, which is only compounded by the fact that the game's timeline falls squarely within the confines of the television show. There's very little flexibility in that framework, which means very few of your decisions can have any far-reaching effects, lest it interfere with the delicate spider's web of plotting already in place. Futility is a concept that isn't explored much in gaming. Most games would rather the player experience a power fantasy, being the one chosen to save an entire galaxy, or single-handedly win whatever war America is, was, or will be fighting. I would hate to sweep the entirety of the concept aside because every emotion, every thought has some place in gaming somewhere. Come to think of it, some games have already played with the idea of free will and player choice to great effect. Bioshock is one that immediately comes to mind. There's room for futility in gaming, but in a medium that requires the audience care enough about the product to invest their own effort to see it through, game developers need to be smart about how they implement it. Game of Thrones, for all its narrative strengths, has very little to say about futility besides being on the bottom rung sucks, doesn't it? That's not enough to satisfy most players, and it certainly doesn't do enough to persuade them to purchase their game incrementally over the course of a year, only to get repeatedly beaten down with nothing to show for it, intellectually or otherwise. Maybe a story where immense loss and failure is a foregone conclusion isn't the best choice for a 12-hour experience that wants very badly for you to weigh each decision. Even The Walking Dead, Telltale's first, darkest, and possibly finest game, shows you that there is light behind every shadow. In Game of Thrones, everything is shadow. Ultimately, I think the developers and I have a fundamental disagreement about what the most important themes of the franchise are. I see Game of Thrones as a way to experience the evils of power and corruption, evils that exist throughout our own world's history in much the same way as the world of Westeros. It's a post-happily-ever-after fantasy that delights in dumping atrocities on the heads of anyone who is even tangentially related to the quest for the Iron Throne. However, it's also a classic hero's journey told through the eyes of several key players. People like Jon Snow, illegitimate and looked down upon by birth, but possessing the heart of a true leader. People like Tyrion Lannister, whose appearance almost totally negates his family name, who has more compassion than the rest of his clan combined, although that isn't saying much. People like Arya Stark, a girl in a land where women are mothers and wives almost exclusively, but learns to fight with skill and presses on even when she believes her entire family lost. Where the game stumbles, besides the player having very little to say in what is advertised as a not entirely linear experience, is how it characterizes the individuals you play as. As a player given a multitude of responses at each apparent juncture, you expect to be able to steer your foresters through how you react to stimuli. When you are given your four options, three phrases in silence, you make the best choice based on what you read on the screen and how the conversation has gone up to this point. The problem that arises, however, is that you can't control the delivery. The phrases you choose may not be the exact words that leave your character's mouth, and what they actually say, coupled with how they say it, may go completely against what you thought you were choosing. More than once, this contributed to a completely unintended outcome, as well as several moments where your response is interrupted by a surprise action or interjection, further underlining how little input you have on a macro level. As you continue the game, you get a better feel for each playable character, specifically who they are as characters and not as playable. This comes too late, however, as you've already attempted to imprint your own decisions on them and create your own characters. If Telltale had given a bit more scripted dialogue to each character before you took control, if they had added more movie to what is already 90% cutscenes to give players a better idea of exactly who they would be controlling, players would experience less dissonance between who they wanted to play and who the game told them they were playing as. These problems, the lack of meaningful agency, discrepancies between player intent and characterization, would be less of an issue if this game were expected to be entirely linear.
A shorter game that focused on the hopeless position of the Foresters, forcing players to do things they perhaps don't want to do out of desperation while embracing the grand storytelling chops that Telltale is more than capable of? That could have been a great experience. A traditional Telltale game that took place outside the established canon of the TV show, focusing on a different time frame, or at least excluding any characters present in the show, allowing for real choice and consequence without catering to the story of another? That could have been a great experience. Instead, we get neither. Instead, the player feels like they're trying to drive with a broken steering column, constantly swerving right while the driver does everything to keep the vehicle moving straight. Now, there were a handful of situations where I, at least in the moment, felt like I had made a meaningful decision that aligned with what I as a player wanted to see happen. One of those occurred in Essos, when the player controls Asher, the exiled forester brother. He receives word of his family's ills and meets with Daenerys, mother of dragons, requesting aid in the form of one of her armies. Daenerys does not promise anything, instead suggesting that if Asher helps her, she will consider offering assistance. It's made explicitly clear through wording and tone that Daenerys will not give you a single soldier, even if her plan, using Asher and his accomplice Beska to sneak into the city of Marine and free the captive slaves there, goes off without a hitch. There's nothing you can do as a player, however. A substantial amount of Asher's storyline includes participating in the Marine operation, so even if you feel it's pointless, you have to go along with the plan anyways. After Daenerys denies your request, though perhaps offering gold should you prove yourself particularly noble, you make your way to a group of pit fighters to enlist their help. You battle one of the pit fighters to the death, and here's where my choice came in. I elected to spare my opponent and deliver a speech about how the pit fighters had no need to battle for the pleasures of their masters, but could instead fight for a higher purpose helping those in need and taking down the corrupt tyrants that threaten them. It goes against everything the pit fighters appear to stand for, this whole showing mercy bit, but it works. I enlisted a band of capable fighters without leaving a single corpse in my wake. While Ash was characterized as brutal early on, I was able to use diplomacy in a way that felt true to who I was as a player, and true to the man Asher felt like he could be if given the chance. It was an elevating moment, even if in the end the pit fighters would have followed you regardless of your choices. Unfortunately, the attack on Marine also includes one of the more obvious examples of the illusion of choice in the form of Beska, Asher's closest friend. Beska, it turns out, was a slave in Marine. That's why she knows the city so well, and is so vital to the operation. During the attack, she tracks down her former master, and you have the option of allowing her to kill him, or forcing her to stand down. I chose to spare the man, and Beska was furious at me. I had already been walking on thin ice with her, agreeing to help Daenerys directly violate Beska's wishes, as she wanted to never visit Marine again, and this looked to be the final straw. However, by the time I reached the pit fighters, we were chumming it up like we had been at the start of our adventure several episodes prior. Ultimately, Beska will follow you anywhere and protect you like a little brother. It turns out the only way you can get her to want to stay behind when you finally set sail for Westeros at the end of episode 5 is if you choose to protect your uncle instead of her way back in episode 2 when your party accidentally encountered one of Daenerys' dragons. And even if you did that, she eventually decides she'd follow you anywhere. This is heartwarming, having such a loyal friend, but it also renders every single choice you made regarding her character irrelevant. You can be rude to her. You can give her the eternal silent treatment, and you will still have her at your side when you make for Iron Wrath. It's a long con and illusion, and pretty disappointing when you start to notice you're being played. Episodes 2 through 5 see Roderick, having been found barely alive after the Red Wedding, taking control of House Forrester. He is betrothed to Elena, a woman he cares deeply about, but who wavers in her dedication to him, due to the precarious position it puts her father and his bannermen in. You can try and fight for your love, which is only salvaged by a single option of promising Ironwood to her father. If you do not say this one sentence, your betrothal is cut off. Of course, it doesn't matter anyways, as a couple chapters later, Lud Whitehill demands Elena marry his son Griff instead, preventing you from marrying Elena regardless. Elsewhere in the series, I played Roderick as a diplomat, which means submitting to nasty men like Ramsay Snow in the White Hills. I kiss rings, I stay on the ground when I pushed, and I reject every form of direct conflict. I am a physically broken man, and my house lacks the strength to combat our oppressors. Instead, I choose to wait for an opening while my house scrapes by. It's during these sections that you get a good look at another one of Telltale's missteps with this entry, the lack of nuanced villainy. Too often, your adversaries take that role not because they have conflicting but legitimate values and interests, but simply because they are bad people. Ramsay Snow is the most obvious and forgivable. His sigil is, fittingly, a flayed man, which is one of his favorite social activities. There's only so much you can expect from that sort of man. But other characters, Griff and Lud Whitehill in the North, Rickard Morgan and Andros in King's Landing, come across as nothing more than petty, greedy, cruel people. 
Sure, they have slightly different ways of going about their misdeeds, but there is rarely motivation that doesn't stem from a desire for money or power. And the reason for acquiring these things seems to often be nothing more than wanting more than what they already have. If Andros was looking to pay off his debts in order to free his son from servitude, or Griff desperately sought the affection of a woman unimpressed by his current status, I would be far more sympathetic towards them. I would truly consider if my own needs were greater than theirs. Ultimately, they always will be because I'm player one, I paid $30 for this experience and I deserve to be the hero, gosh darn it, but at least I'd weigh my options more carefully. Instead, every antagonist is a shallow self-serving roadblock, and they could all be swapped around with little change to the plot. It's a shame, really, considering the intrigue that characters like Sander Clegane, Littlefinger, and Jamie Lannister provide by having their own desires, fears, and motivations that, while ultimately bullying down to money and power for the most part, stem from very human catalysts. As I mentioned before, Roderick was leading the Forrester clan through, in my playthrough, diplomacy. Unfortunately, that basically meant taking every opportunity to submit to the White Hills as part of a larger strategy. That's another thing this game fails to nuance. It gives you plenty of opportunities to take the path of least resistance, while rarely allowing you to clarify that doing so allows you to live to fight another day. It's a commonly held belief that all men must be strong in Westeros, and strength is only shown through standing tall and fighting. Planning, mercy, and survivalism are frowned upon. At one point, Roderick encounters Ramsay Snow flaying an ally, and offers to let Roderick stab him in retaliation. If you choose to attack, you are deflected and taken to the ground. If you choose to not give in to your rage, Ramsay will consider you craven. Several other times, you are given the chance to do exactly what all other men in Westeros do, which is respond with fists and swords. Doing so results in a net loss. You are defeated or called disloyal. And not doing so results in a net loss. You are weak, cowardly, or shameful. Of course, some of this just stems from the overall culture of Westeros across all representations, but the point still stands. You really can't win in this game. During the fourth episode, Roderick and crew make for the White Hill stronghold to rescue younger brother Ryan under the guise of wanting to discuss a truce. After a short discussion, you are given several options, one of which is to attack Lud White Hill, grab your brother, and escape. After all, that is exactly what you plan to do. It's pretty much the first time you'll be able to meaningfully strike back against the White Hill family. Unfortunately, if you make this choice, things don't go well. And by that, I don't mean that your attack is botched and you end up leaving without your brother, a bit worse for wear but still being funneled along in the direction the story needs you to go, which is showing subservience to White Hill. No, if you choose to attack, you are given a video of a grisly battle in which every forester is slaughtered in an unwinnable melee. You receive the Valor Morgulis game over screen, and you have to go back and choose another option. It's a step worse than the scripted failure and illusory choice because at least that would validate Roderick's choice to engage the enemy. Instead, you are told that that is flat out a choice that he can never and will never make and are sent back to try a different path. Even if the Roderick you've cultivated would only choose the path of defiance. It's a slap in the face and really soured my experience even more than the spoon-fed disappointment of most other scenes. It's a shame that, despite being the only female player character and the only one with almost zero options of violence, Mira's storyline tends to be the weakest. The only particular highlight is a scene where you sneak into a party and can play the game, as it were, by eavesdropping on several conversations, then using the information you picked up in one group to affect your interactions with another. It's not particularly expansive, but it feels more like something you would expect in a Telltale production. Taking a moment to explore the people and things around you, and coming up with a solution that isn't just barging straight ahead to the next plot point. Even if it's ultimately scripted, the illusion is particularly strong here and results in one of the few moments of genuine enjoyment I had in King's Landing. The rest of her segment mostly boils down to Scapegoat Simulator 2014, where you are blamed, justly or not, for a variety of ills that befall Marjorie Terrell, your fellow handmaiden Sarah, and a host of scummy highborns who think they're better than you. In the end, you are accused of the murder of a member of the Kingsguard, and have the choice of turning on your acquaintance Tom the Coal Boy, or taking the punishment yourself. Watching a teenager get beheaded was not something I expected when I woke up the day I finished this game, but that's Game of Thrones for you. Whenever you think you found a hero on Westeros, they head off. Garrett, on his way to the North Grove, was the character I initially felt the biggest connection to, and overall his segment bore the most character consistency. Many of my dialogue choices for him ended up with a sort of stoic silence, which goes a long way at the wall and beyond. He is the first character the player takes control of, beginning the game by polishing his master's sword. His arc is inextricably tied to the Bolton clan, as one of the men who killed your father ends up at Castle Black with you, and attacks you atop the wall. You can make every effort not to fight, explicitly saying that you won't engage in combat with the man, but in the end, quick time events force the two of you into an unavoidable melee. At the end, you may choose to make him suffer, push him off the wall, 
or presumably show mercy by walking away. I naturally chose this last option, explicitly stated to be leave him, believing I would be punished for harming a brother, but allowed to give my say. It turns out that between episodes, the Bolton lad dies regardless, leaving you as a murderer despite taking the choice that initially appears to spare the man. It's a frustrating result, just another moment I felt I had control over, but really did not. Hindsight being as it is, it's not entirely fair for me to lament the inevitability of some plot points that only reveal themselves later on. The illusion of choice from earlier episodes is slowly lifted as you progress through the story, when you notice how many supposedly pivotal moments could actually go only a single way. Seeing other players' choices via the post-game comparison also highlights some of these moments, for better or worse. No, Game of Thrones does not go down as one of my least favorite Telltale experiences solely because of my post-game analysis. Instead, it makes its most grievous mistake by telegraphing the futility so frequently. You can sense the direction a conversation is going more often than not and have no real control over its outcome. So much of the story is tightly woven like the Game of Thrones TV series, a compliment in most situations, but a severe detriment to a supposed branching narrative. The only choice that has a significant impact on the game you are playing is who sacrifices themselves during the White Hill ambush at the end of episode 5, Asher or Roderick. Every other choice is either an illusion, a window dressing, your choice in Sentinel, for example, primarily affects who betrays you, but since the role of Sentinel must also be the role of betrayer, it lacks much of a punch, or a choice that could be resolved in the sequel but may not. We won't know until after the final TV season in 2019, if ever. All Telltale games have a spread of choice results like this, from Batman to The Wolf Among Us. The difference is whether or not you are emotionally invested even in the choices that don't mean much. In The Walking Dead, the bond between Lee and Clementine was so strongly written, so deeply powerful, that even the smallest interaction felt like a gut punch of raw emotion. In Game of Thrones, the defeatist tone coupled with the heavy telegraphing of inconsequential choices wrung out most of the attachment I might have had to these characters and how my choices affected them. They ultimately became sad, gray people in a sad, gray world, living sad, gray lives that I couldn't change whether I wanted to or not. Tales from the Borderlands, which I began the day after finishing Game of Thrones, was a breath of fresh, sugary, cell-shaded air. It has almost everything Game of Thrones did not provide me. A vibrant world, a dynamic cast of heroes with real humanity, sympathetic antagonists with character arcs, a propulsive story, and laugh-out-loud moments the likes of which I'm not sure I've ever experienced in a video game. To this day, I am baffled at how this game only performed a handful of Metacritic points better than Game of Thrones. Most critiques I see of Telltale games stem from technical limitations caused by an aging engine stretched to its limits. While I will admit that both games experienced some hefty load times and graphical hiccups, as a gamer, my personal priorities are story, character, atmosphere, and gameplay, with less of a focus on perfect performance. I have some baseline standards, such as a working save state and an absence of game-breaking bugs, but overall I put the artistic experience ahead of the technical one, which is where I think many critics get hung up on when reviewing Telltale products. They make valid points, but I personally see a much, much wider canyon separating these two titles. Before I dig into the meat of Tales from the Borderlands, I want to acknowledge the biggest difference between the two releases, the tone. Borderlands, as a franchise, relies on a quirky, irreverent script and cartoonish art to set it apart from most other games. Game of Thrones is remarkably dark, gritty, and realistic, at least in comparison. My goal is not to say that Sunshine and Fart Rainbows are better than Grim Dark Sadness, because both have their place. Heck, one of my favorite Telltale games was the first season of The Walking Dead, which is even more upsetting than spending a dozen hours in Westeros. What I will focus on instead is how Tales from the Borderland creates its tone, and uses it to fuel the experience in a much more substantial way than Game of Thrones. Borderlands and Borderlands 2, a pair of loot-based shooters developed by Gearbox Software, both tell the story of a group of vault hunters, the player or players, who scour the space western planet of Pandora, hunting down heavily guarded treasure troves known as vaults. Along the way, you learn class-specific skills, battle alien wildlife, bandits and corporate robots, and collect a ridiculous amount of procedurally generated guns. We're talking literal millions of firearms, each slightly different based on their manufacturer, damage, accuracy, reload speed, player level, and unique ability. Each game included four different Vault Hunters at launch, and the first game's Vault Hunters appear in Borderlands 2 as plot-relevant NPCs. There are also dozens of memorable characters from both games, from mechanics to outlaws to underaged pyros. A third game in the franchise, Borderlands the Pre-Sequel, was produced by 2K Australia and introduced space mechanics, 
Vault Hunters previously seen as NPCs in the first two games, and a more direct storyline focused on the origin of Handsome Jack, the charismatic and murderous leader of the Hyperion Corporation, before his death in Borderlands 2. Let's dig into the first episode of Tales from the Borderlands. Like Game of Thrones, Tales from the Borderlands puts you in control of multiple protagonists. You begin the game playing as Reese, a company man from the satellite Helios, which is owned by the Hyperion Corporation. In the present, he is captured by a mysterious stranger and made to tell his story, tied up alongside a woman that we will soon be very familiar with. Reese begins his flashback, which is where the bulk of the story takes place. Up on Helios, it turns out, Hyperion has been going through some changes since Handsome Jack was killed. Amidst the turmoil, Reese has positioned himself with the help of his friends Yvette and Vaughn to receive a huge promotion and follow in the footsteps of his idol, Jack himself. When Reese arrives at his boss's office, he finds his superior has been blasted into space and replaced with his rival, Hugo Vasquez, who instead demotes Reese to janitor. During the ill-fated meeting, however, Vasquez takes a call and Reese overhears his plans to purchase a vault key. Leaving, Reese plans to go to Pandora and, with some help from Yvette and Vaughn, obtain the key himself. Upon arriving on Pandora, Reese and Vaughn quickly learn that they might not be entirely cut out for roughing it with bandits in the desert. They stumble their way to the meeting point, calling in a Hyperion loader bot to take out some nasty ruffians along the way. The transaction takes place in a strange sort of museum, which features an array of corpses on display. One of the corpses holds a drive belonging to a former Hyperion scientist, which Reese inserts into his own cybernetic implant to allow him to bypass some security measures. Soon, they meet August, the bandit providing the vault key, and his accomplice Sasha. Sasha is wary of Reese and Vaughn, but quickly changes her mind regardless of what the player says to her. August then shows his own trepidation, but the player is able to convince him with a powerful appeal that either blows his mind or breaks his heart. Except, it didn't happen that way. You see, there's another big player in this whole thing, Fiona the con artist. She is Sasha's sister, the woman who provide August with the vault key to sell, and your other playable character. She takes over the narration and explains Reese actually got on his knees and pleaded for August to take the deal, which Fiona knows because she had been hiding in the vent behind Sasha the whole time. It turns out that the vault key was a fake, constructed by Fiona and Sasha's mentor Felix in order to make a quick buck. Fiona, using her skills in deception, convinced August to make the deal with Vasquez, but when things go sideways at the deal, she has to escape. Fiona and Sasha return to Felix's caravan to see Reese and Vaughn trying to steal it. They all escape together, but along the way the briefcase with the $10 million brought to purchase the vault key is lost to the bandits. It winds up as prize money for a bandit death race, which Fiona and Vaughn enter as competitors, while Reese and Sasha sneak into the facility, a former Atlas building. There, they meet Zero, one of Borderlands 2's playable characters, who is searching for something called the Gordis Project. The race begins, and chaos soon erupts as Zero makes to attack the bandit leader, Bossa Nova, and Felix betrays his wards and attempts to make off with the cash. Vaughn, however, had rigged the briefcase with explosives, which Fiona can warn Felix about. Alternatively, she can let him blow up with the money, or as a third option, she can use the single bullet from her secret emergency pistol to shoot her betrayer if she hasn't used up her ammo yet. After the battle subsides, Zero leaves, but your trusty loader bot returns, and Reese finds himself in a hidden underground portion of the facility. His new comrades join him, exploring the mysterious room and eventually unlocking access to a strange two-part octagonal device. Asking what it is, a mysterious voice announces that it is the Gordis Project. The camera pans, revealing the owner of the voice, a blue, semi-transparent, handsome Jack. The first episode of a Telltale game, like the pilot of a TV series, is rarely the strongest. Its goal is to lay groundwork to build off in subsequent episodes and give the audience enough incentive to stick around for the next chapter. So while episode 1 of Tales from the Borderlands is no masterpiece, it does a great number of things right. First, it provides a greater introductory framework for the two player characters. By adding just a bit more uncontrollable dialogue in the early portions, the player gets a much better idea of who they're going to be controlling. Having only two roles to introduce compared to Game of Thrones' is five, three in episode 1 with two more introduced in episode 2, eased the strain of setup and allows the players to get more quickly invested in their roles. Additionally, the choices in Tales from the Borderlands are less binary, or I suppose quaternary. At any point, the player can choose any one of Reese or Fiona's options, and it feels like a natural continuation of the character, as defined in tandem by the developer and the player. Game of Thrones' decisions often boil down to fight or give in, while Tales from the Borderlands provides more nuance. In many cases, the outcome of the dialogue is a foregone conclusion, which as mentioned previously is inevitable in these games. However, your options to respond acknowledge that although the end point is set, you can tweak your journey there by choosing sincerity, sarcasm, confusion, and so on, 
You can rotate between these at your leisure, because rarely does someone use one tone for every single response they ever make. I did not encounter any point where I felt the game was creating a false choice, such as attacking the White Hills in their fortress in Game of Thrones. Any denied selection stemmed from a reasonable amount of agency on the part of the NPC I interacted with, rather than a thinly veiled no trespassing sign. It also helps immensely that both the player characters and the NPCs are likable. I don't mean they're all heroic, because that would be bland and cultivate immense disdain for the cast. Instead, each character is given enough humanity, laced with their own forms of humor and moments of sincerity, to show why I should care about them. Reese and Fiona are strongly characterized even without the player's help, but you are able to give them additional layers that pay out in dividends by the time their journey concludes. Their comrades range from the no-nonsense Athena to, if you play your cards right, the comically egotistical foul-mouth claptrap robot. Any one of these characters could have been a one-note info dump character, especially those pulled from elsewhere in the franchise. But they are each given room to breathe and flourish on their own. Even without their backstory from the previous games, these NPCs had apparent and valid motivations and were given the opportunity to evolve. Tales from the Borderlands is benefited tremendously by the fact that, unlike Game of Thrones, it is chronologically the most recent entry in its franchise. It had to be consistent with everything that came before, yes, but its destiny was entirely its own. As such, it was able to take risks that were locked away from Game of Thrones. Scooter, the dim-witted but good-hearted mechanic responsible for setting up vault hunters in the previous games with a variety of vehicles, develops a crush on Fiona and meets his presumed death in Episode 4, going down with a faulty rocket while allowing the rest of your crew to continue their space journey safely. Helios, whose distinctive H shape has been prominently displayed in the night sky above Pandora since 2009, is completely destroyed by Reese towards the end of the game, forever altering the direction of the series. Tales from the Borderlands is more than just a spin-off. In some huge ways, it's a vital continuation of Pandora's history. While both Game of Thrones and Tales from the Borderlands feature you playing multiple protagonists, their approach differs in one key way. In Tales from the Borderlands, Reese and Fiona directly interact. In some episodes, like the first, you tell the same event from two different angles, and the pair bicker about whose version was more accurate. In others, you're flip-flopping between the two in fast-paced life-or-death scenarios. In these situations, the game uses clever indicators of who you're controlling next, such as having one character toss an item to another. And finally, in the game's conclusion, Reese and Fiona walk alone, discussing their adventure and where life might take them next. You control both sides of the conversation, and can use this moment to explicitly steer their relationship as business partners and friends, as well as make concrete decisions about the rest of your party. In this last scene, you feel as if you're writing the final chapter yourself, while simultaneously leaving your own personal loose ends to tie up in a sequel. A sequel which, three years on, unfortunately shows no signs of life. In most Telltale games, there is a rudimentary interaction system and inventory in place when you are not participating in cutscene-style gameplay. Some sections will have you walking from point A to point B, or searching a specific area for some sort of goal. These portions slow the gameplay down considerably, allowing the player to choose their own pace for a time. You can make small talk with NPCs in the area, examine details of the environment, and collect items that may come in handy later on, should the game prompt you with an opportunity to use them. The Walking Dead still remains the best at providing meaningful world building during these segments, as you create social ties with your band of survivors and become immersed in the isolation of a zombie wasteland. Game of Thrones used these segments to almost universally poor effect, giving you next to no incentive to explore over just panning your cursor around for the one target that says use instead of look at. Tales from the Borderlands falls somewhere in between. It lacks The Walking Dead's compelling moment-to-moment -moment necessities like divvying food or comforting Clementine but its colorful and unique world gives the player at least some motivation to take more than a cursory look around, and exploration is rewarded with insightful and amusing narration from the player character. But Tales from the Borderlands also brings two entirely new methods of world interaction to the table. As Reese, you can use your cybernetic implants to go into a sort of detective mode that lets you scan an area for hidden information and objects you can interact with. In one segment, you use your scanner eye to follow a trio of power lines to their respective controls in order to progress the story. When Reese scans an object, an often hilarious profile of the target pops up on screen, delivering a mix of relevant data and wit. It's not remarkably different from the other games' walking and clicking technique, but it does give some depth to the process. Fiona's bonus interaction, however, is far more engaging. While exploring the environment, Fiona can come across cash. She may obtain it by opening a lockbox, checking behind a poster, or pickpocketing a corporate stooge. 
This cash can be used at various points in the story to add cosmetic personalization to your game, ranging from a new hat to a complete overhaul of your caravan's paint job. The choices don't ultimately mean much, but they do give your playthrough a more deeply personal affair. You can see your choices on screen, even when you're not selecting dialogue prompts, because that new outfit Sasha is wearing will stick with her for the entire episode, if not longer. Furthermore, your cash carries over from one episode to the next, forcing you to think long term. Do you pass up on the intricate psycho mask in episode 1 to save up for a steampunk dress in a future episode? Or do you splurge now because YOLO? Because some items cost significantly more than others, you are encouraged to not only manage your money wisely, but also explore every inch of the environment to grant yourself as much economic freedom as possible. Like I said, it's not a life-changing mechanic, but it goes a long way towards making the player feel deeply invested in their own playthrough. Speaking of spending wisely, I was particularly pleased with Fiona's gun mechanic. Instead of having an enormous excess of weapons and ammo like most Vault Hunters, Fiona begins the game with a pocket pistol that contains a single bullet. During Episode 1, you are given multiple opportunities to pull the trigger, but only have the resources to make that choice once. Not firing is always valid, but some moments really do feel like the time to use your only shot. Giving the player a limited tool and an excess of opportunities to use it forces them to weigh their decisions carefully, because there's no way to undo a pull of the trigger unless you start the whole episode over again. Eventually, Fiona gets a weapon upgrade and a surplus of ammo, making your choices in the matter less weighty, but it was sure fun while it lasted. As the story progresses, you encounter more and more NPCs who come to your aid. Athena, whose artistic use of an energy shield would give Steve Rogers a run for his money, is one of my favorites. She has promised her girlfriend, a mechanic named Springs, that she's given up the dangerous vault hunting life. It turns out, however, that Felix assigned her to watch over Fiona and Sasha, putting her in immense danger. She can handle her own for sure, but this puts significant strain on her relationship with Springs. When you eventually meet Springs, you have to decide how you want to approach the matter. Do you take the blame for dragging Athena down with you, or stay out of it? How you play this moment is important, as is your decision of whether or not to launch Scooter's space billboard after his sacrifice. How you navigate your interactions with Springs, a seemingly C-list NPC, will make or break your opportunity to request her aid at the end of Episode 5. The primary arc of the story is as follows. First, the crew discovers that the Gordis Project is a three-piece device designed to locate a teleporting vault and hold it in place. Gordis is also an adorable wide-eyed robot companion who is very excited to meet some new friends, including a fellow machine in Loaderbot. Your ragtag team must track down Gordis's two remaining pieces while avoiding retaliation from Vasquez and Valerie, a bandit queenpin and August's mother. Gordis is assembled, but nobody is prepared to defeat the Vault Guardian, so Fiona is forced to destroy Gordis in order to send the Vault away and prevent further destruction. You encounter more familiar faces from the franchise than you may know what to do with, but your journey finally brings you to a climactic rematch between your group, featuring a rebuilt, now skyscraper-sized Gordis, and the monstrous Traveler, Guardian of the Vault. When preparing for this confrontation, you are given the option to bring in three allies in addition to your regular team of Reese, Fiona, Sasha, and Vaughn. The screen pans out and shows silhouettes of many characters you've encountered on your travels, including Zero, Athena, Springs, Felix, August, and Dr. Cassius, a former Atlas scientist who can only be recruited if Fiona prevented his death in Episode 3 by stopping Athena from completing her vengeful goal of wiping out the Atlas Corporation. Selecting a character on this screen shows you several pivotal interactions between the player and the character, and determines their status as an ally based on how you treated them. If you blamed August for the botched vault key transaction, he won't take kindly to you asking for help. Heck, Dr. Cassius and Felix may very well be dead in your playthrough, or alive and ready to go, all based on what you did with them. Your final team depends on your choices, real, tangible decisions made throughout all five episodes. While the end result is the same, defeating the Traveler, and obtaining the riches of the Vault, the flavor of the final battle changes dramatically based on who you recruit. Although the story is originally fueled by desires for power and money, the same motivations that fuel so many of Westeros' inhabitants, Reese and Fiona develop compassion for their comrades, and your final assault on the Vault isn't really for riches at all. Gordis, the sweetheart you've been trying to construct this whole time, is inextricably tied to the existence of the Vault of the Traveler. As long as it exists, popcorning around the universe, Gordis will remain a target of those who wish to conquer the Vault, and forced into an unwinnable fight against the Traveler any time the Vault is summoned. With Timork, however, you can free Gordis from the cycle, and grant her the opportunity to live as a liberated machine, whatever that means on Pandora. How does the game bring you to this conclusion? By kidnapping you. 
I mentioned that episode 1 is framed as a flashback told alternatingly between Reese and Fiona while they are bound and guarded by a mysterious stranger. That framework persists until episode 5. Vaughn, who went missing earlier in the story, reappears and rescues Reese and Fiona from the stranger while taking the masked figure back to his base for questioning. In the aftermath of Helios crashing to Pandora, a group of refugees from the Hyperion base have made a home in the rubble, along with Vaughn and your old friend Yvette, if you rescued her during your assault of the station. It is there, about an hour before the game concludes, that the stranger's identity is revealed. It's Loaderbot, your trusty ally who was missing and presumed exploded after shoving Reese into Helios' last escape pod and staying behind. It turns out he survived the crash and attached his important bits to a lifelike endoskeleton. Loaderbot witnessed what he thought was a betrayal of Gordas during the first fight with the Traveler, and wanted to hear the truth of Reese and Fiona's story before passing judgment on them. After proving that you did what had to be done, Loaderbot produces a roughed up but functional Gordas, paving the way for the conclusion. Personally, I love the framework. It adds another layer of intrigue to keep the player going, forcing you to pay close attention to everyone you meet to try and determine who the masked stranger is before the final reveal. It also gives far more depth and complexity to a robot character than I could have ever hoped for. I had an immediate attachment to Loaderbot because of his strong sense of duty and coldly compassionate attitude, which the player can build off by putting Loaderbot's needs ahead of their own, or even just giving him a good fist bump. In the end, my investment in Loaderbot paid off in spades, and I was genuinely pleased to see he had not been torn to bits during Helios' downfall. Whether or not the player predicted the identity of the stranger is ultimately not that important. Throughout most of the game, Fiona and Reese are more interested in explaining their past and getting out of their shackles than identifying the kidnapper, so the reveal plays better than if the entire story hinged on it. It's a good twist, but it isn't the crux of the plot, and being a good detective is rewarded with satisfaction for solving the puzzle, instead of disappointment that there's nothing left afterwards. I want to talk a little more about the ending, but before I do, I want to backtrack to some important elements in the episodes leading up to it. Throughout the game, sparks fly between Reese and Sasha. While the potential for romance adds some character depth, it doesn't intersect with the core plot enough to derail it. If you play Reese as romantic, Sasha reciprocates without moving too quickly to feel realistic. If Reese is reserved, in your final moments with Fiona you can deny attraction towards her sister, allowing the player the choice of falling in like with a collection of pixels. I genuinely felt Reese and Sasha had chemistry. Both were portrayed excellently by their voice actors, Troy Baker and Aaron Yvette respectively, and both were written with dignity and humanity. The affection feels earned, not forced, and is given time to grow over the 10 or 12 hours the player puts into the experience. And, most importantly, Sasha is not just the love interest NPC. She is an absolute dynamo, eager to jump into the thick of things, capable of defending herself in a fight, and putting immense stock into loyalty. When she learns of Felix's betrayal, she is rightfully enraged, refusing to even look at the small present he left for her in his lockbox. When it's finally revealed to the party that handsome Jack inhabits Reese, Sasha shows far less restraint than Fiona. On the flip side, however, you can make great strides with Sasha by letting her try out your stun baton, trusting her to use it safely and return it to you. Whatever direction you choose to take her relationship with Reese, it makes sense. In Tales from the Borderlands, the women are just as varied and humane as the men, and there sure are a lot of them. It's great. Some scenes involve four or five women interacting at once, and at no point does it turn into a catfight or a parade for the men to ogle at. The women are drawn, literally and figuratively, with fantastic variety. Valerie is large and in charge, ruthless and merciless. Athena is no-nonsense and fueled entirely by vengeance and duty. Yvette is a company woman through and through, but with a soft spot for her friends. Sasha places loyalty above all else, and Fiona is in over her head in a gunfight, but more than capable of talking her way through most situations. Even Gordas, the adorable robot, presents a different but equally valid female character, combined with a youthful naivety that makes you want to fight for her. And the game makes no effort to draw your attention to the diversity. It doesn't smugly announce how forward-thinking it is, and it doesn't fill the male cast with misogynists who scorn the women for trying to find a place in the man's world of Pandora. In a similar fashion, Athena's sexuality has no bearing on anything but her own personal character. She is in a complex but loving relationship, and that's all that needs to be said. Nobody gets hung up on the term girlfriend, just like nobody gets hung up on Reese having a robotic arm. The game isn't trying to make any big socio-political statements, it just wants to make Pandora as diverse and lived in as our world. People are people, and in Tales from the Borderlands, all people are nuanced and engaging. Earlier, I stated that this game possessed several laugh-out-loud moments. I do not make this statement lightly. 
I enjoy a good joke, but I rarely laugh out loud at books, movies, or video games, especially when engaging with them alone. Getting an audible rise out of me when I'm not in a room with others to share the laughter with can be a tough challenge, one the game tackles with aplomb. Not long into your adventures on Pandora, Vasquez touches down to confront Reese. One way or another, he ends up dead in Episode 3, and Reese uses a customization machine to disguise himself as Vasquez, right down to his alluring voice, provided by the excellent Patrick Warburton. The gang heads to Helios, and you casually engage in a couple finger gun battles with passing employees. When you pretend to shoot them, they do their part, doubling over in mock pain while you continue forward, you expert gunslinger you. It's funny, but not riotously so. But then the big twist happens. Still in disguise, you are confronted by some Hyperion suits that don't take kindly to Vasquez's return. They corner him just outside the main foyer, and Rizquez is running out of options. What does he do? He engages in an all-out, no-holds-barred finger gun shootout with dozens of corporate stooges. He's got pistols, he's got machine guns, he's got grenades, he's even got an invisible knife that he uses to hold an accountant hostage. You dodge incoming attacks, slide down banisters, and eventually stand tall while bodies litter the floor, all without a single drop of blood being spilled. None of them are harmed, at least physically, but the finger gun fights on Helios appear to have reached mythic proportions, and everyone treats them with the utmost seriousness. When I realized what was happening, that Reese had no weapons whatsoever, but made the exact motion of drawing dual pistols, I lost it. It was the giddiest four minutes I have ever experienced playing a video game. What makes it special, besides the sheer absurdity of the scene and its gleeful homage to action movie tropes, is how it fits in with the rest of the game. Borderlands has always kept it silly, right next to its enormous armory and body count, evident since the first time you encounter a psycho charging at you with a meat cleaver in one hand while screaming, I love you! Tonally, this scene, while absurd in almost unprecedented levels, is incredibly accurate. But taking the extra step to establish the finger gun culture of Hyperion, something Reese is acutely aware of since he began this journey as a Hyperion code monkey, helps socket the scene neatly in place with everything that's come before it. Telltale, when they make the most of their opportunities, can have their cake and eat it too. Now, you may have noticed that it's been some time since I last mentioned Handsome Jack. While the game is supposed to be about completing Gordas and opening the Vault of the Traveler, it is in many ways Jack's story too. Although Jack is first introduced in Borderlands 2, his story begins much before that, from his abusive childhood to his violent rise to power in Hyperion. After the players of the first Borderlands successfully defeat that game's Vault Guardian, Handsome Jack claims credit for the whole thing and establishes himself as a self-described hero of Pandora. His plan, in very broad terms, is to use his corporate holdings and the powers of the vaults to force peace across Pandora by killing anyone who gets in his way and reshaping the planet into one of his own liking. These are classic supervillain tropes, but they are tropes for a reason. Marvel's Magneto wouldn't have nearly the longevity he does if he didn't honestly believe he was doing what was right for mutant kind, and to that end he has some valid points along the way. Giving a villain not just a motivation, but one where they believe they are doing the right thing, presents the audience with a lot more to chew on than a blind thirst for money and power, and all things cruel. This is one of the missteps of Game of Thrones, as I can't for the life of me figure out how any of the deplorable people in Westeros imagine themselves as heroes. They are painted without nuance, while Handsome Jack vehemently believes he's the protagonist of his own grand tale. He believes this to a fault, even, engaging in some impressive mental gymnastics to convince himself of his heroism. He sees the destruction he's wrought, and can't bring himself to admit that he is actually on the wrong side of this whole thing. Perhaps, deep down, the vile creatures that inhabit Westeros have accepted their roles, taking no pains to justify themselves, and instead embracing their lot in life as the one few will root for. If that's the case, maybe Game of Thrones has a point. I would certainly make the case for George R.R. R. Martin having the awareness to write characters in this way. Unfortunately, whether or not that was the intent of the game, it comes across as lazy and flat, something that Tales from the Borderland expertly dodges at almost every conceivable turn. Despite being the head of the Hyperion Corporation, and seeming almost singularly focused on wrecking the Vault Hunters of Borderlands 2, there is more to Jack than meets the cybernetic eye. He has been a husband, twice in fact, and one of those marriages yielded a daughter named Angel. Some of you may recall a character named Angel appearing in the first Borderlands. This character, who watches over the players and guides them on their journey, is Handsome Jack's daughter. She is a siren, a rare being of varied power born unexpectedly to Jack and his first wife. After her powers accidentally kill her mother, Angel is restrained and slowly turned into a tool for Jack to obtain power from the vaults and their guardians, furthering his goals of world domination. Jack believes, or wants to believe, that he's doing what's best for his daughter, 
by protecting her from a dangerous world and stopping her from harming anyone else. Angel, rightly, feels nothing but hate from her father, and a lust for the things her birthright can obtain for him. At the end of Borderlands 2, Angel is willingly destroyed by the Vault Hunters, and Jack pleads with her, saying they can make things right. She rejects this with her dying breath, and Jack, having lost the last tether to his old humanity, has completed his transformation into an undeniable villain. He is soon after killed by the Vault Hunters, and his reign of terror is over, until Reese accidentally implants him into his own brain. During episodes 2 through 4, Jack makes several attempts to assist Reese, offering ways to bypass firewalls and reprogram enemy robots. He also cautions Reese against informing the others of its existence, and when I had Reese finally reveal the truth, Jack was right. Nobody took kindly to it, nor the deceit that kept the truth from them for so long. On Helios, Jack plays a pivotal role in obtaining the final Gordas piece, which is kept in his office. Jack offers Reese a chance to sit at Jack's old desk, fulfilling his lifelong dream of being just like Jack. Reese sits, and episode 4 ends with the player choosing to either rule Hyperion or reject the offer. Depending on how you've played Reese, staying true to his original character, or allowing him the opportunity to rethink his priorities, either choice seems difficult to Reese, but eventually justified. No matter your choice, however, Tales from the Borderlands does still have a certain linearity to it, and part of the necessary road the game takes is revealing Jack's true plan. Regardless of whether or not Reese actually wants to rule Hyperion, Jack intends to take his job back. Reese almost immediately finds himself trapped in Jack's office chair, as a half dozen robot arms tipped with horrific implements buzz and whir towards him. Jack always intended to find his way back here, once Reese activated him. He will cut Reese open and refit him with a custom endoskeleton that Jack will control in its entirety, effectively giving Jack a human body again at the expense of Reese's conscious autonomy. It's a hazy plan, and one that could only remotely work in a cartoonish sci-fi world like Borderlands. Thankfully, the ridiculous problem has an equally ridiculous solution. Jack's office chair, you see, has wheels. Reese simply scoots himself out of range of the mechanisms, frees himself, and finishes destroying Helios. Jack is enraged, and having uploaded himself into Helios' system earlier in the break-in, pursues Reese on video screens and sends whatever he can to stop the player. He ultimately fails, seething with rage as you destroy the last tangible piece of his legacy. Helios crashes to Pandora, and Reese awakes in his escape pod nestled among the rubble. While navigating the wreckage, Reese has one last encounter with the hologram of Jack, still kicking about in Reese's implants. Jack has lost everything. His wives, his daughter, his company, his honor, and even his life. He has time to reflect on what he's done, in a way that he couldn't during the blinding rage of his final living hours. He's still handsome Jack, of course, egotistical, cocky, and selfish. But he finally acknowledges that, even if he tried to see himself as a hero, perhaps few else did. He sees a lot of himself in Reese, and warns him that he may follow in Jack's footsteps after all, making sacrifices for a greater good that might not even exist. Jack gestures to the twisted metal and crushed concrete that surrounds you. How many Hyperion employees did you let die in order to stop Jack? There weren't enough escape pods for everyone, he tells you. What's the difference between what you just did and the things that made Jack infamous? You can answer how you like, but it's a valid question. Jack was a man brought down by his own hubris, and that sort of failure has to start somewhere. Maybe Reese is a better man than Jack, or maybe he just hasn't found his breaking point yet. Jack makes a final, desperate attempt to wrestle back an ounce of control. He takes over Reese's cybernetic arm and forces him to choke himself. Reese, now understanding that Jack won't stop his quest for power, even at his lowest moment, finds a final way to defeat him. He rips his arm out of his socket, pops off the cyber lens in his eye, and removes the brain implant from the panel at his temple. Jack realizes that the end, the final, undeniable end, is here and pleads with Reese to stop, groveling at his feet. There's nothing back there, he says, referring to death. No loved ones, no eternity, not even endless suffering for all his wrongs. The only thing a man like Jack, hell-bent on taking everything that he could in life, could ever truly fear, is nothing. An emptiness without meaning and without end. For all his bottomless wealth and almost godlike power, his one fear is unflinchingly human. Reese gives one final tug, the implant pops out, and Jack flickers into nothingness. While Reese has the option to pocket the implant, I chose to destroy it. With a simple closing of Reese's one remaining hand, Handsome Jack is gone. For good this time. While Jack's original arc began and ended in Borderlands 2, what began as an epilogue in Tales from the Borderlands turned into an almost pitch-perfect breakdown of the character, and serves as a more fitting and emotionally rewarding end than a guns-blazing boss fight. With the flashbacks over, Reese, Fiona, Loderbot, and the rest gather up and prepare to defeat the Vault Guardian for good. 
At this point, you make your selection of three NPCs to join your party. For my playthrough, I chose August, Athena, and Felix. If you choose Felix, however, he coordinates a meeting place but is a no-show. Instead, Fiona finds a wireless communicator attached to a wardrobe ejected from the caravan way back in episode 1. Felix is on the other end. He reveals that his betrayal was in fact part of a longer con. He always planned to betray Valerie after the Vault Key con. During the death race, he switched the money in the briefcase with counterfeits, kept a million dollars for himself, and placed the remaining nine million in a wardrobe, the same one you are now standing in front of. That money was always intended for Fiona and Sasha to take and start a new life, one where they didn't have to lie and cheat and steal to scrape by. It's a bit convoluted, but the sentiment is nice. What's more interesting, however, is that this is the only way to achieve closure with Felix. If you chose to kill him in episode one or don't select him as an option for the final battle, his story is over, either lying dead in the desert or hiding off somewhere in the far reaches of Pandora, never to be heard from again. You're still one Vault Hunter short, however, so you use a portion of your newfound funds to hire a professional. The result is Claptrap, one of the franchise's mascots, both loved and hated in equal turn by the player base. If you're like me and didn't get sick of him in the Gearbox titles, or just haven't played a Borderlands game in a while, it's a nice surprise. He injects a familiar and ridiculous spark into the party dynamic. So, with your new hire and some old friends or frenemies, you are finally ready to make another go at the vault. Gordis is reassembled and, thanks to some upgrades from Loaderbot, appears somewhat like a rounded version of a Gundam. Your party splits into several groups. Fiona and Sasha's job is to drive inside the Traveler by predicting his teleportation pattern and launching their vehicle to the exact place he will end up when he reappears, thus placing them somewhere in his guts. From there, they will disable the organ that allows him to teleport, making him vulnerable to a large Hyperion laser cannon that Vaughn has repurposed. The NPC team provides cover fire and draws the Traveler's attention. Reese is the motivational speaker, tasked with convincing Gordis that this is not in fact an awful idea that will get them all killed, like last time. Gordis will then help position the Traveler for the final strike. It's a crazy plan, but considering this is a planet built on crazy plans, there's a chance it just might work. Things, of course, do not go off without a hitch. Vaughn fires the laser too early, resulting in a classic wait for the weapon to recharge sequence. In a Telltale game, that plays out a little differently considering its intensely scripted nature. Fiona and Sasha make it inside the Traveler and, like a few other times in the game that I haven't mentioned yet, Fiona can make several strategic choices. Getting from the landing point to the teleportation gland is a given, but Fiona can visualize some interactions between her and the Guardians, alien creatures that live, among other places, inside the Traveler. The player chooses between two options several times, resulting in a relatively individualized strategy of getting to the target. Once that's done, Sasha and Fiona make a mad dash out of the Traveler, using a remote detonator to destroy the teleportation gland. They misjudge the detonator's range, however, and Sasha sacrifices herself to go back and detonate the explosives, leaving her within range of the blast. It's a moment the player can see coming, but because of how well Sasha has been drawn up to that point, it still succeeds in creating a real feeling of dread. Reese and the NPCs, meanwhile, utilize the manual controls within Gordis, which look like arcade stations, to fight the Traveler. Each character gives Gordis a different fighting style, so when control rotates between the characters, Gordis is given different battle animations. Reese only knows how to give finger guns, which have a tangible laser effect this time, a solid conclusion to the gag's arc. Athena lends her shield throwing skills, while August has more of a barroom brawler style. Claptrap, the lunatic he is, materializes a ridiculous amount of rocket launchers. Finally, Gordis reveals an immense hard light buster sword and beats the wounded traveler into position to be re-lasered. With a cataclysmic blast triggered by Fiona herself, the beast is destroyed, Sasha still trapped inside. What follows next is a mix of celebration and mourning as Reese and Fiona search for Sasha's body. They locate her, and she is alive, but not for long. The player characters say their tearful goodbyes, but Sasha seems to be taking longer than even she expected to pass on. With her final breaths, she asks to see the present Felix left for her in his hideout so many episodes ago. Fiona had the option of trying to look inside it earlier in the game, but being a respectful sister, I chose not to. Sasha opens it and finds a simple pocket watch, with the words, Time Heals All Wounds, taped to the back. She scoffs, finally realizing how worthless Felix was, and begins floating. The watch, through a mix of dubious science and plot armor, completely heals Sasha's wounds before dropping her back onto Pandora and breaking her arm. She's mostly okay, though, and the gang celebrates, no holds barred, by looting a vast number of treasures that have been strewn across the battlefield after the Traveler's demise. Gordis, back to her little roly-poly self, thanks you for your help, and scoots off to spend time with Loaderbot. They make a cute couple, one of your characters says, and it's hard to disagree. 
In the final minutes, Reese and Fiona race to the actual vault, realize how out of shape they both are, and walk the rest of the way. It's here that you can have Reese decide to explicitly announce his affections for Sasha, or let it be, and it's here you can decide what Fiona's future might hold. More conning, perhaps? Or the Vault Hunter life? These topics are ultimately open-ended, and the game concludes with the camera facing Reese and Fiona as they open the mysterious treasure at the heart of the vault. In the end, the player is given a far wider range of emotions to interact with than Game of Thrones. You have the triumph of conquering the vault, the dread of losing Loderbot and then Sasha, the relief of losing neither after all, the actual sorrow of saying goodbye to Scooter for real, and the desire to find out what happens next. While every one of these emotions is valid and powerful, I find the last to be the most surprising and exciting. I hadn't heard much about Tales from the Borderlands, good or bad, before starting it. I hadn't heard much about Game of Thrones either, in fact. I'm a fan of Telltale Games as a studio, and picked up both games primarily because of their logo in the opening credits. So when I found myself clamoring for more of these characters for the first time in a Telltale game since The Wolf Among Us in 2014, I was remarkably pleased. With a sequel to The Wolf Among Us slated for release in 2019, I can only hope a sequel to Tales from the Borderlands follows soon after. By the end of the 11 episodes and 20 plus hours of gameplay spread across Game of Thrones and Tales from the Borderlands, I was surprised with my takeaways. I was confused at how a narrative-focused game based on tight plotting and a wealth of memorable characters could fail to make me feel anything but the anxiety of constantly checking my achievement list to see how much further I had to go before I was done for good. I was similarly confused, but far more pleasantly so, at how an action-light take on a game focused on exhilarating gunplay and looting could move me with a compelling story and fleshed-out characters. I didn't hate Game of Thrones, mainly because I've only ever hated two or three games in my life, but I consider it the weakest entry of Telltale's library, with Minecraft story mode its only possible competition. But partially due to my expectations of the game based on Telltale's track record and the story's source material, and partially due to the proximity of my playthrough of Tales from the Borderlands, Game of Thrones left an ultimately sour taste in my mouth. I came into Tales with fond memories of playing Borderlands with my dad, so that could have also affected my enjoyment of it, as well as how it immediately captured my interest more than the game I'd just completed. Ultimately, however, I do believe that it's a simple case of one product being much stronger than the other, and if at the start of this I'd been told I would find one game significantly more impressive than the other, I don't think I would have chosen Tales from the Borderlands as the decisive victor. That's the way the cookie crumbled, though, and what a delicious cookie it was. Thanks for watching.